So again, this video is going to cover 2.4, which is a library of parent functions, and 2.5, which is transformations of those library functions. You can either open these together in one note, or you can have them as two separate ones, but you need both open. So start with parent functions. Parent functions are the graphs of these types of equations, specifically functions, okay? And your goal is to like basically memorize, so you don't have to plot points for these, basically memorize what these general shapes look like. And then in a, in, when we get into 2.5, you're going to see we're going to start to move these all around. We're going to move them right, left, up, down, flip them upside down, stretch them, shrink them. Okay. So it's important to know when you see the equation what the graph looks like. So the absolute value graph is first. Obviously, I know it's absolute value because it has the absolute value of bars on my equation. An absolute value with just x by itself, which is what that parent function is, has a coordinate point or a vertex at zero, zero. So that's my initial point. And then it goes up one and out one in both directions. These would end with arrows, which means it would continue on forever in that pattern, okay? And it is a sharp V at the bottom, so it's important that you don't round it like a parabola. We're gonna practice domain range increasing, decreasing, and constant behaviors with each one of these. So remember, domain goes left to right. If I'm going from left to right, what would be the domain on this graph? Good. Those arrows point left to right, which means negative infinity to positive infinity, which would be true for any absolute value because there's no restriction there. How about the range? We're going bottom to top. What's the lowest y on this graph? Zero, and it's a dot, so it's going to get a bracket. And then those arrows point up, so it's going to go to positive infinity. If I move from left to right to look at the increasing, decreasing behavior, we start by falling as we move from left to right, which means decreasing from negative infinity up to the x where it stops and changes direction, which would be zero. Increasing and decreasing always gets the parentheses. And then it changes direction and comes back up again, which means increasing from zero, and it would continue to increase until positive infinity. And there is no constant. So you can either, I think on WebAssign DNE, okay? This actually, this homework is a, a PDF, so you can practice the graphing. So if you could put none for the constant there, there's no constant. Questions on that one? Yep. Why is there a bracket on the range? Because this is a point that's on my graph, right? Like that dot is a solid dot. If it was an open dot, which you won't get open dots on any of these parent functions, but if it was an open dot, that's when it would get the parentheses. Okay, I'm going to go down because that's the more common one. The next one is a quadratic function or what we call a parabola. This is an x squared, so the point is at 0, 0, and there are arrows at the end of these. This time it has a rounded bottom, but pretty much everything else is the same. This domain would be from negative infinity to positive infinity because my arrows point left and right. My range starts at 0 and goes to positive infinity, so it's a bracket on the 0 going to positive infinity. It starts, if I go from left to right, decreasing. So decreasing from negative infinity up to zero. And then it changes direction and it comes back up again. So it's increasing from zero to positive infinity. And there is no part of the graph that's constant. So absolute value of x is the v, x squared is the parabola. None. Yeah, there's no horizontal part to those. Yep. The graph, yes. All the stuff underneath, no. So the graph has to have a sharp point for the absolute value. It has to have a V, whereas this is like that U shape. Yep. Increasing and decreasing can never have brackets because a point can't be increasing or decreasing. Yep. Constant start stop. Con constant with a solid dot, yes, but the other ones, no, never. Okay, then go back up to the square root function. So the square root function, and it's hard to see, but it does have a point at 0, 0, and then it's like half a parabola turned on its side.
this is the first time we have a restriction on domain because there's a square root there, right? So the square root, whatever's underneath it, has to be greater than or equal to zero, which, which, which means my domain is going to be from zero to positive infinity. And then the range lowest y is again at zero, and that arrow would point right and up, so it goes to positive infinity. Left to right movement is only increasing, so it's increasing from zero to positive infinity. There is no decreasing, there is no constant. Okay, cubic function, which means x to the third, and this graph is a little deceiving because it doesn't come up like this, like this was the only way I can make that shape, but it comes through zero, zero, and stays underneath, so it looks like it's above it right there, that doesn't, it shouldn't go above it, okay? Basically, x cubed is like a parabola with the one side flipped upside down, so if I took my, v, my u and I broke it at the middle, and I took the left side and flipped it down, that would be what the cubic shape comes from. And there's no restrictions on domain because you can cube anything, which means this is negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range all points down to up, so this would also be negative infinity to positive infinity. From left to right, this is continuously increasing. So it's increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity, has no decreasing or constant. So it is not a straight line. It does have that little bit of a curve right around the, the, um, the origin, okay? But it is increasing that whole time. And then the last parent function that you need to have memorized is the cube root function. And that cube root function is like the square root above the x-axis, so that same shape as the square root, but underneath it flips and goes back the other direction. And again, it would have arrows. So domain is not restricted in any way because you can cube root anything, so this would be negative infinity to positive infinity, which means my range is going to keep getting lower and, and greater, which means it is also negative infinity to positive infinity. And from left to right, it is increasing, which means it's increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity, no decreasing and no constant. So again, in the next section, we are going to take and start to move these things in all directions. We're going to move them up, down, right, left, uh, make them reflected over the x-axis, and stretch or shrink them or vertically um, compress or, or stretch them. And so with those, you might change your domain and range. This is just the parent function domain and range. But it would be important to know how to graph the parent function before you start to move it around and then also how to read the domain range increasing, decreasing, and constant. Questions so far? All right, these are piecewise functions. So we're gonna go back to the parent functions in a minute, but these are the piecewise functions. So we talked about how to evaluate these, right? Like if I told you f of zero, you'd have to figure out which of those um, equations to plug it into and plug it in. But for these, we're actually graphing them. So there are two ways to do it. I'm gonna teach you both ways and you get to choose, okay? The first way is to graph each one separately in its entirety. So if I do that, I would say this first one is y equals 2x plus 3. And I would go to the graph and graph that. It's a line. So I'd start at positive 3. And my slope is up 2 over 1, or down 2 and left 1. And then I draw a line. But then I only want this to be true for the values in which x is less than or equal to 1. So I go to my graph. I locate where x is equal to 1, which would be this coordinate point here. 
If it was less than, I would make it an open dot, but it's less than or equal to, so I'm gonna keep it solid. But then I'd erase everything that's not in that range. So less than or equal to zero would be this whole side of my graph. I mean, sorry, less than or equal to one would be that whole side of my graph. And I would erase the rest of it. So that's the first part of it. The second part is y equals negative x plus 4. So I'm going to graph that, which would have a point at 4. And it would be negative x means down one to the right one or up one to the left one. And that's what the line would look like if it was just that line by itself. But because it is, sorry, let me make this a little darker. Because it says this is only true for the values in which is x is greater than zero, I'm going to locate where it's zero and put an open dot on it and then keep what's to the right and get rid of what's to the left. So because this is still a function, it has to still pass my vertical line test, which means those two points that are at where x is 1, one has to be solid and one has to be open, or they could both be open, but they can't both be solid, otherwise it would fail my vertical line test. And then they can't overlap beyond that. Yeah? What exactly is the vertical line test? If I draw a vertical line, if it hits my graph at more than one point, it's not a function. Anywhere, any vertical line. So here, 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 anywhere on that graph. If it intersects my graph at more than one point, it's not a function. You're welcome. Okay, the other way to graph these, and I'll show it to you with number two, is to plug in points. So for me, if it's lines, I do it the way we just did. I think it's easy enough to just draw the line and then erase the part you don't want. But as we get into ones that are not just lines, it might be easier to plug some points. So I'm going to start with the first one, which is one half, negative one half x minus six. And that's true for values that are less than or equal to negative four. So I'm going to start with negative four. That's going to be the first point I'm going to plug in. And then I'm going to plug in points that are less than that, which means like negative five. So if I plug in first negative four, I get negative, let me do it the same color, negative one half times negative four minus six. And this is a positive two minus six, which is negative four. So the first coordinate point I want is negative four, negative four. And then I'm gonna plug into the left of that because it has to be less than negative four. So negative one half times, and I could do negative five because um, that would be the next one, but I'm going to end up with a fraction. So you can also do negative six, like you can pick whatever you want, but let's say it's negative five minus six. This is positive five halves minus six or five halves minus 12 halves, which is negative seven halves, negative three and one half. God bless you. So negative five, negative three and a half is the next point. You could have also used the slope from that coordinate point. You could use either one. Sophia. So it's, so the, the point is the W plug in and then it goes to the Correct. Yep. Or you could use the slope. Like once I get negative six, I know my slope is negative one half. I can go down one into the right two or I can go up one into the left two and I connect the points that way. You could do it either way. And then the next part of my graph is true for negative four with an open dot and to the right of negative four because greater than. So I'm still gonna plug in negative four. Negative four plus five would be one. So negative four, one. But it's gonna have the open dot. Negative four, positive one, open dot. And then I can use the slope from there or I could plug in the next point like negative three, negative three plus five, which would be two, negative three, two is the next point. 
and my arrow is going to go in that direction. So again, for me, the lines, I just draw them and erase what's not there, what, what shouldn't be there, okay? But when we get into ones, which you'll see on the next slide, like if it's an x squared or a square root, and you maybe don't know the full um, shape of your graph, that's when you would want to plug in some points. God bless you. Questions so far? Two five is transformations of functions. So we're gonna take all those parent functions we just talked about and start to move them around without having to plot points. So there will be one exact point, but then that's pretty much it. The rest of them is approximation of the rest of the graph. So we are gonna use shifts, shifts up, down, shifts left, right, okay, to move around the graphs. And then we're gonna use stretching and shrinking to make them more narrow or more wide. And then reflection would be like a flip upside down, okay? This is obviously not as accurate as plotting points. If we wanted a very accurate graph, we would plot points. But if you wanted to just get an approximation of where it would fall, this is the easiest way to do it. So the first is vertical shifts. If you are adding or subtracting from something outside the parentheses, outside the absolute value, outside of the square root, so not underneath or in parentheses, it causes a vertical shift. So whether it's like the absolute value of x plus a number or x squared plus a number or square root plus a number or x to the third plus a number and those numbers are not in parentheses or inside those absolute value bars, that's going to take your graph and shift it up that number of units. If it is subtracting, so if it's x minus a number, x squared minus, absolute value of x, sorry, minus, x squared minus, square root of x minus, or I don't know why this zero is here, this should not be there, or um, x to the third minus a number, it is a shift down that number of spaces. So you just physically take your vertex and you move it up or you move it down. So the first thing you have to identify is what's the parent function and then what's the shape of that parent function. So if I'm looking at one and I have f of x equals x squared minus two, what's the parent function shape? What is x squared? The u or a parabola, right? That's what that tells me. So that's where I would start. That's a parabola. And then the minus two after it says what? Down two. So where my normal parabola would be at zero, zero, and then I'd go up and out one, and I'd draw it like that, that's where my parent function would be. All right, it is a shift down two places. So I take my vertex, I shift it down two places, and then parabola again, up one and out one in each direction. This would be my shifted parabola. Again, if it says to keep both, you would keep both. Like if it says to graph both on the same graph, you're gonna graph both. If you're just going to the shifted one, then you don't even need the first one to begin with. Sophia. But how do you know that it's all minus one versus two minus one? That's the parent function. So any x squared does that, up and out. It's always at the one? What's that? If it's not like a narrow or stretched, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now let's change this to plus two. And what does that do? Up two. So I'm gonna go up two and then literally draw the parabola. All right, if it's inside the absolute value bars, inside parentheses, underneath the square root, so it's grouped with the number, then it causes a horizontal shift and it goes in the opposite direction your brain thinks. So your brain probably says plus means I'm gonna shift my axis to the right and minus means I'm gonna shift it to the left, but it is the reversed for the horizontal because if you actually set it equal to zero and find that coordinate point, you have to reverse that sign. 
So anytime it's inside, it's going to be a shift left. If you're adding and anytime it's inside and you're subtracting, it's going to be a shift to the right. So opposite direction. So look at three. First of all, it's an x squared, so I know my parent function is a parabola. And then the plus two inside the parentheses caused the shift to go where? Left two. So I go left two, I plot my point, I go up and out the ones, and I make the u. Say again. At the five. Oh no, no, that's the arrow. We don't know that. We'd have to plug in a point. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just do the up and out one, and then draw it through those points, and then beyond that, it really doesn't matter because it's just an approximation. Yeah. All right. So go to four. Now it's a minus two inside, which means. To the right two. So I go to the right two, I go up and out the ones, and I draw my parabola. <coughs> then I go to five, and it says x cubed minus one. So this shape is my cubic shape, which was does that, like the left side of my parabola flipped down. And the minus one is causing what kind of shift? Is it in parentheses? No, so it does what? Yep, this would be down one. So I literally take my graph, I shift it down one, and I draw the cubic function. And again, it's not gonna be perfect. These are approximations. If you wanted perfect, you'd pl more, plug in some more points. What happens with six? What's the plus inside the absolute value doing? Two. Left two, good. And the plus one after the parentheses? Up one. So my coordinate point is normally at zero, zero. I'm gonna move it left two and up one, and then I draw my cubic function passing through that coordinate point. All right, what's happening with seven? First, parent function, cubic, right? So it goes up to the right, down to the left. The minus three inside is causing what? Right, three. The plus two outside the parentheses is up two. So I'm gonna go to the right three, I'm gonna go up two, I'm gonna plot my point, and I'm gonna draw my cubic function passing through that point. Okay, go to eight. What's the parent function this time? Square root, which is that little like parabola, half a parabola turned on its side, that little arc. The minus three inside the square root is doing what? Right three, the plus two, up two. So I go right three, I go up two, and I point the curve to the right. All right, a reflection is caused by a negative in front or inside. And the difference is where does, what's it being reflected over? If it's on the front, outside of your function, so if it's on the front of the x squared or on the front of the absolute value or the front of the x to the third or the front of the x, or the square root, then it causes a flip across the x axis. Really, it just flips it upside down. So if it's a parabola, this would be my normal parent function would point up, the reflection points it down. 
The absolute value would be a V pointed up. The reflection flips it upside down. The cubic function that normally goes up to the right and down to the left flips to go the other direction. A square root normally points up to the right. It flips and points down. All of those are over the x-axis or upside down. So part, part of this test is multiple choice. And if the multiple choice says like a reflection, it will be specific to the x-axis or the y-axis. And if you're going to graph it and you wanted to describe it, you could totally just put upside down. But that would be across the x-axis. If it's inside the function, like with the square root, then it flips it across the y-axis. So it's going to point it to the left if it is a square root. So where my normal function, if it's a square root, points it to the right, the negative points it to the left. On a V, it's just gonna flip it. It really doesn't matter. It changes the direction of your horizontal shift. On an absolute value, it changes the directions of your, abs of your um, horizontal shift, but I'll show you that in a second. If it's a cubic function, it flips it. So the cubic function, X on front and X inside looks the same because if you flip it upside down or you flip it left to right, is the same. The, really, the biggest difference will be the square roots. The square root will point left instead of upside down or down. All right, so look at nine. The minus on the front is causing what? It's going to flip upside down or a reflection over the x-axis. The plus 2 is doing what? Up 2. Good. So I go up 2, and instead of pointing it up, I point it down. For the square root, the negative is inside, so instead of it flipping upside down, it points it left. Or a reflection over y axis so it goes from zero zero and it points to the left we get to these the last reflection i mean the last transformation is if there's a number on the front so if the number on the front so if it said it would say like ax squared okay if the number on the front is in between 0 and 1, so we disregard a negative. The negative causes a reflection that's different. If A is in between 0 or 1, which means it's a fraction, not improper fraction, but an actual fraction, okay? Then it's called a vertical compression or a shrink as though the ceiling and the floor are caving in on it. If A is greater than one, so now we're talking two, three, four, five, all the way, whatever number it wants it to be, it causes a vertical stretch. Or as though the ceiling and the floor, were, like you tied strings to the end of your graph and you pulled them up, okay? For a lot of this, it makes it more narrow or tall. Could be descriptive terms. And if you think about what's happening, like if I multiply whatever it is by two, it's getting twice as tall every time. If it was a three in the front, it's getting three times as tall with every point. So it's growing faster. So if I get two X squared, there's no horizontal shift. There's no vertical shift, right? There's no reflection. It's literally just taking my points and it's making it more narrow. So if you think about it, if I plugged in one now, I'd get two times one. So it goes up to two. And if I plugged in negative one, it'd go up to two on that side as well. It just makes it a skinnier parabola. So it is more narrow, okay, or stretched vertically than my standard curve. If that was a 10x squared, then my first points would be all the way up here. It'd be super skinny. It's just making it more narrow or, again, vertically stretched. Yep. Sure.
we're gonna, I'm gonna add to this one, put a one half there. So for two, yeah. For 12, you get the negative. What's the negative on the front of the square root do? Flips it upside down, right? Or over the X. The one half is separate. So you have to treat them as though they're two separate things. The one half is gonna make it compressed, vertical compressed. Again, as if the ceiling is caving in on it. So it's pushing it to be flatter. And it's a square root. So that arm that normally points to the right, which looks like this, is flipping upside down. So if it was just the upside down, it would be this. But it's also like the floor and the ceiling are caving in, making this a flatter curve. It is closer to the x-axis. That's a bad drawing because it looks like it's not decreasing and it definitely has to be decreasing. But, so it goes here. And it would be like half as tall. So each of those coordinate points you would then cut in half. If I square rooted one, I'd get one, but cut it in half, it's one half. If I square rooted four, I get two, but cut it in half, you get one. So that's where that half comes from. It would cut it in half. So same thing is true for the x squared. The one half is going to be a vertical compression. It actually makes a, a parabola wider because it looks like it's being squished. There's no other transformation, so the zero would be zero. And then instead of it being one and one, it's at one half and one half. So it's a wider parabola. We're going back to the piecewise functions of like from two, four. So if I look at three, my two graphs are now the first one, which would be a line. Y would equal, I'm gonna switch the order so it makes sense, X plus two, that's gonna be a line. So if I graph that, I'd go up to two. My slope would be up one and over one. I'd draw my line. Oops. And I want it to be only true for where X is less than or equal to two. So I'd go to where X is two, which is right there. And I go less than, which means point it left. That part would get kept and the right side would be erased. So only where it's less than or equal to two. So the other part says x squared minus 2. What kind of graph is a y equals x squared minus 2? It's a parabola with what kind of shift? Nope. Down. <laughs> if it's inside the parentheses, it's horizontal, right? If it's outside, it's the vertical. So this is down 2. So if I had just drawn just that, parabola, it would look like this, okay? But we need it to only be true for values that are greater than two. So I'm actually gonna get rid of that graph. I know about what it looks like, but I'm gonna plug in the point at two, starting at two, but it's gonna be an open dot. So two squared minus two is four minus two, which is two. So I plugged in two, I got two out of it, but it's an open dot because it can't include it. Then the next one I could plug in is three. Three squared minus two, nine minus two, which is seven. So three, seven is the next point. And I know that this is the right side of the parabola, so it's gonna keep increasing like that. It's not gonna be a line because it's got like a curve to it, 
but you don't have the you part of this parabola and it's totally fine. Questions on that one? Okay, then the last one has three parts to it. The first one is a line, so I can draw my line and erase. Okay, so if I start at positive one and my slope is two thirds up two to the right three or down two and to the left three, I'd have my line. I only want it where it is less than or equal to negative one. So it's actually gonna start with an open dot because it's less than or equal to. And it's gonna be pointing to the left. So that's the first part of your piecewise function. Then I get x squared minus one from negative one to positive one. And what is x squared minus one look like? A graph is it? A parabola with a, what kind of shift? Down one. Good. So we would shift it down one and we'd go up one and left one and up one, right one. Only this time, this says, oh, this should have been, the green should have been solid. This should have been solid. So this one is solid. The purple is what it can't equal, right? Because it says negative one is less than, not less than or equal to. So this tells me open dot here, solid dot here, which means it's just that little U part of the graph. And then the last one, the order is rearranged. So if I wanted to rewrite it, I would get y or f of x equals negative x squared plus three. What kind of graph is that? Good, upside down parabola with what kind of a shift? Good, so I'd go up three, and normally I would plug it, I would just point it down here, here, point it down. It would be like that. But this is only true for where it is greater than zero or greater than one. So instead of it being there, it's going to have an open dot at one. And my graph is only going to point down on the right hand side. And again, if you're like unsure, you could always plug in a point. So we know one would be three minus one squared, three minus one is two. So one, two is that coordinate point, and it's an open dot because it's not or equal to. And then I could plug in two, three minus two squared, three minus four, which is negative one. So this curve is actually even more steep than we drew it. It would be two, negative one. So there are going to be parts on the assignment that are um, just transformations. You're shifting right, left, up, down, all that stuff. And then there's going to be parts that are your piecewise. So again, this homework is uh, a PDF so that you're drawing every single one. Obviously, if it was on WebAssign, you wouldn't be hand drawing it and you're going to hand draw on your test. So it's important that you do it by hand. Okay. But you got to just make sure that you're showing your shifts. Yeah, Ada. Yeah.